Are the slides visible? Can you see yes. them? Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. So shall we uh, get started? Uh, yes. Everything is ready. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second nuclear engineering seminar. Uh, my name is Jason Ho. It is my great pleasure today to introduce the speaker of the seminar, Dr. Gregory Delipi. Dr. Delipi is a postdoctoral research scholar in the reactor dynamics and the fuel modeling group in our department. He's a, uh, he has a background in electrical and computer engineering with a specialization in reactor physics and engineering. He recently obtained his PhD from CEA Ecole Polytechnique of Paris in France in the field of transient multiphysics and certainty quantification. Dr. Delipi's main research area is multiphysics and certainty quantification and multi-fidelity fuel performance modeling. In the former, he is interested in the design of experiments, dimension reduction, surrogate models, and certain quantification, sensitivity analysis, and model calibration. In the latter, he is developing methods that use high fidelity fuel performance codes in order to inform lower fidelity codes that can be used efficiently in the uncertainty quantification framework. So with that, Gregory, the floor is yours or the screen is yours. Please um, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hu. Uh, so yes, hi everybody. So my name is Gregory Delipe. I'm a postdoctoral scholar. scholar and uh, today I will present a part of my work that was conducted during uh, my thesis at CERA. And the work consists um, of the pellet cladding gap heat transfer high to low modeling for road ejection accident in an uncertainty quantification framework. So the presentation uh, is divided into five parts. In the first part, we have an introduction to the subject. In the second part, we will see the, some best estimate uncertainty quantification. We will detail what is best estimate uh, right after. In the third, we're gonna see our uh, high to low gap heat transfer approach that we developed. Uh, then we will, introduce, we will improve our previous model and we will call it improved best estimate and we will perform again the uncertainty quantification and we're gonna see the results. And finally, in the last part, we will have some general conclusions and perspectives of this uh, work. Let's start with the introduction. So the general motivation um, of, the, of this uh, subject is the fact that um, the improvement of nuclear reactors modeling uh, and, the, and the increase of the requirements in terms of safety uh, analysis, uh, requirements with regards to the codes, leads to or led towards the development of what we call best estimates plus uncertainty um, approaches, or in short, BEPU. So uh, in order to understand them, let's first, uh, in, let, in a, a, let's say in a regulatory, regular, regulatory condition, let's say, we have some safety limits that are imposed by the physics, for example, the fuel temp melting temperature. And then the regulatory requirements have a safety margin on these limits to, uh, to be able to, to, to be more sure about uh, our licensing process. And so these regulatory requirements will be, for example, in the fuel melting temperature, a lower temperature. Now, you can see that the, there is also a significant margin, or at least it should be, between the real value that we will in the reactor and the, these requirements. In order to verify this, uh, conservative calculations were, before BEPU, conservative calculations are, were usually employed, where you penalize the parameters with regards to the, uh, the quantity uh, uh, related to the limit. And then, uh, hopefully, you find that your conservative, cal conservative calculation under different conditions, nominal, transient, et cetera, uh, are, is below the regulatory requirements. Now, BEPU approach take a different, um, a different, uh, sorry, take a different approach where best estimate codes that are codes that can simulate the, phys the underlying physics uh, better with higher fidelity than the conservative calculations. And also they use the reference values that they do not, do not penalize 
quantities uh, in order to obtain a value closer to the real one. But in order to be sure about our margins, uncertainties are as attributed to the inputs, thus creating some uh, bounds around our best estimate uh, calculation. And this whole approach is, called, is what we call BEPU. At the end, BEPU approach should, should provide larger margins than conservative calculations. And this is of high, high interest due to the licensing, licensing margin that we can gain in our design of nuclear reactors. Now, uh, when we will perform one, let's say, if we want to perform one BEPU analysis, uh, a lot of times we are focusing on transients. And the modeling of transients uh, is, can be quite complicated, especially if we have multi-physics interaction, as in the road ejection accident case. Uh, so in interactions, when physics interacts, some uh, quantities of neutronics, for example, might impact thermal hydraulics, and some quantities of thermal hydraulics might impact field thermal mechanics, and at the end, maybe all the quantities will interact with the, all the physics can interact with the others. This creates a lot of um, computational issues for the coupling, even for just the best estimate uh, evaluation, not even to consider the fact that we will have uh, uncertainties uh, in our modeling. So this creates very challenging uh, conditions for our BEPU or any uncertainty quantification using, uh, let's say, more high fidelity codes. So, Finally, in order to uh, reduce this computational cost, uh, there is a strong interest in high to low approaches where uh, the high fidelity code in one of the physics or maybe all can be, can be used to inform outside of the coupling or uh, offline or maybe either, even online, a uh, lower fidelity code than then will be used in, the in multi-physics coupling. And now the computation will be more efficient and still preserve some kind of uh, uh, more the, the underlying physics. So here the example is, for example, if you have a high fidelity code um, represented by the evaluations by the dots, then your model can, can be fitted uh, or at least informed to uh, try to simulate, emulate this behavior in a much uh, simpler modeling. Now, uh, more specific with regards to this work, our objective is, uh, our point of focus is the road ejection accident at hot zero power conditions. So this kind of uh, transient, this study of this transient uh, involves uh, multi-physics coupling between all the disciplines, neutronics, pure thermal mechanics, and thermal hydraulics. And as we saw before, each discipline in the BEPU framework uh, has input uncertainties that need to be analyzed. And this creates a very large computational cost uh, if our codes are high, high fidelity codes um, or best estimate ones. And uh, this, at least for this road ejection accident, uh, the computational cost is mainly bared by the pure thermal mechanics modeling. And thus, in uh, our uh, approach, we, tend, we want to focus on the, the gap heat transfer from the whole fuel thermal modeling, we, because we think that it, it is the main point of uh, discrepancy between, um, between the low fidelity codes and the high fidelity codes. And because the high fidelity codes will model the variations of the gap uh, or the conditions of the gap, uh, uh, taking into account complex thermochemical or, or physical chemical uh, or or mechanical uh, phenomena, while the lower fidelity will, might only treat, for example, the thermal aspects. So we would like to be able to create a methodology to calibrate or inform the lower fidelity gap heat transfer through a higher fidelity code. So this is our objective. Now let's start with uh, the road ejection, a brief reminder of what is this accident. So first, we have a control road that is ejected from the core due to a mechanical malfunction. This uh, insertion of reactivity due to the control road ejection will create a rapid power increase, uh, temporal, and also very localized around the control road ejection location. Uh, once the, so the, in the beginning, the power will increase in an adiabatic way. Uh, after a, a few seconds, uh, milliseconds, the temperature will start increasing as well, and this will create a Doppler feedback, which has a negative feedback on the power, and thus, it will create the peak that we observe on the temporal evolution. And uh, later in the transient, when the heat uh, generated in the fuel will reach the coolant, it will create a second feedback from the moderator. During the whole transient, there is a possibility to lose the first safety barrier, which is the cladding. And thus, cladding failure can occur and uh, damaging our reactor. So we want to assure that this will not happen. Now, uh, in the coupling framework that was used in this work uh, that is for developed in CEOA, where the thesis was 
uh, where um, the thesis the thesis was performed, we have two different couplings, and those were uh, done were uh, were done before my thesis. So my, the thesis was a contribution to this. The first uh, so first we have best estimate codes for every domain physics domains. We have Flicka four code for core thermohydraulics, Apollo three for core neutronics, and Alcyon one for core fuel, fuel thermomechanics. So now uh, the first coupling is just to couple all the best estimate codes. And this is what we call as a best effort coupling. This uh, sort of coupling is very, very expensive uh, because all the, all the physics are, uh, let's say best estimate. Uh, the goal of our work we, uh, will be to try to find a balance between this best, eff best effort coupling and what we call the best estimate coupling where only neutronics and thermal hydraulics uh, uh, let's say disciplines are considered, or at least the codes, and in the, therm the field thermal thermomechanics are considered only through the internal field thermal model of Flicka 4. Uh, this model is very limited, limiting, because essentially it uh, assigns just a constant value to the gap heat transfer, and thus we are forced to apply uh, constant values with large uncertainties, and this can uh, create biases and even uh, larger uh, underestimation of our safety uh, of the reactor. So our approach will be to create what we call improved best estimate, where instead of using the fuel thermal model, we will use our high fidelity code, Alcyon 1, uh, to inform a simplified gap heat transfer model uh, th that we will calibrate and then introduce into the fuel thermal uh, solver of Liga 4. And then we, in that way, we could provide a more realistic uh, uh, gap heat transfer evolution. We can see that uh, in the figure what, uh, to what we aim for. For example, the best estimate with the black uh, line. Okay. So the best estimate with the black line assigns just a constant value with large margins. Something that we can see that is clearly false. Uh, we have one typical Alcyon uh, estimation of the uh, gap heat transfer evolution in blue. And we can see how edge gap really behaves during this transient. Now, uh, our end goal is to be able to approximate this, one, this behavior as good as possible with our calibrated model and then assign uncertainties on the model in order to create those bounds. Because also we will, we will not be very confident if we don't uh, estimate uncertainties on our model. Finally, this uh, simplified calibrated model will create the improved best estimate and we will perform the uncertainty and quantification with this new uh, coupling framework. So uh, before and seeing the methodology, let's first see the best estimate uncertainty quantification to first identify if there is any need to improve the gap heat transfer model. And second, uh, to also lie the groundwork uh, on which we will base our methodology afterwards. So before uh, seeing the uh, uncertainty quantification results, we, need to, we will present the geometry and the modeling which will be the same uh, for, uh, for both best estimate and improved best estimate uh, calculations. So in neutronics, well, you can see in the figure that we have uh, a burn-up distribution in the whole core, it's at the end of cycle. You can see also the control rod ejection towards the periphery. And you can also see that we have four radial meshes. This is a, the neutronic mesh per uh, assembly. Uh, we have also a total of 34, 34 axial meshes and th of which 30 of them are for the active fuel part. In thermal hydraulics, uh, yes, and in neutronics, we use 3D two-group diffusion to analyze it. Thermal hydro in thermal hydraulics, we use a multi-1D porous modeling with a discretization of what, one channel per assembly. So we need to average our four uh, uh, meshes that we have in the assembly uh, coming from the neutronics. Uh, also, actually, we have, we model the 30 meshes that consist the active part. In fuel thermal, inside I remind the thermohydraulics code. We have a radial 1D uh, average pin power, pin um, per assembly. And again, the same discretization as the thermohydraulic channel with 30 axial measures. Uh, we have also some general um, um, specifications for the core where we can see that we have 193 fuel assemblies. It's a typical uh, PWR lattice. And uh, we also have an xenon axial profile, which is important because it can Create, it will create more uh, control load worth when the control load will be ejected. So we want to be in a kind of a worst case scenario. 
So the initial conditions, as we mentioned before, we start at hot zero power, meaning that the power is very low, as you can see from the table. And the control load is inserted on 97 centimeters from the top. And so this part will be responsible for inserting the control, or the, the, the reactivity. So now, before entering, uh, understanding the results, we will present the reference scenario. So for the reference input values, um, the control load worth is uh, $1.2 dollars. And we can see that we have a, a power evolution with a max reach, reaching the max at around 0 0.3 uh, seconds. Uh, we have a width of 38 milliseconds and uh, we can see that the maximum power is about 2.5 times the nominal. This is the core integral one. If we uh, consider also the 3D deformation, we can see that the local can be much higher. Uh, now, on this reference scenario, we apply our uncertainty quantification methodology that uh, it's not the point of this presentation, so we will not present the approach that we developed, uh, that it was the other big part of the thesis. But if you want to find more information, I refer you to a paper that we published in MNC last year. And this methodology included a screening process, a dimension reduction, surrogate models, and uh, the ascent propagation was done in order to estimate outputs, uh, probability density functions, or the histograms. And uh, finally, a global sensitivity analysis was performed using Shapley indices. Now, our inputs and outputs for this uncertainty quantification uh, span the three domains, neutronics, thermodynamics, and the fuel thermal. We have a total of 22 inputs, where we have the neutronics cross two group cross-sections, the kinetic parameters in neutronics. Uh, in fuel thermal, we have the cladding and fuel thermal conductivities. We have the cladding and fuel specific heat capacities. We have, of course, our gap heat transfer that now is an input as, as we mentioned, a constant value, so we will assign large uncertainties on this constant value to cover all the possible variations. We also apply uncertainty on the roll on temperature and the power radial profile. Uh, in thermohydraulics, the identified important inputs are the convective heat transfer, the recondensation model that we used, our criterion for reaching DNB conditions, departure from nuclear bo boiling, and uh, the, if we reach it, the post DNB uh, departure from nuclear boiling heat transfer. Now, our outputs of interest are three scalars and one functional. We add the functional one to add more um, flexibility to our uncertainty quantification method. And also because in some applications, it might be interesting to study a 2D instead of one scalar quantity. Now, in the scalar ones, we have in neutronics, we have the local linear power and its maximum in time and space during the transient. We have the maximum fuel stored enthalpy, again, in space and time. And we have the minimum uh, DNB, which is the distance from reaching the, um, the criterion of uh, departure from nuclear boiling. So this is the minimum quantity, uh, yes, in, in time and space. And finally, we have our functional quantity is the radial distribution of the linear power at the time and at the axial position of the local maximum linear power. So I will not present uh, how we quantify the uncertainties of those parameters because again, it's not in the scope of this presentation, but more information can be found in the paper that I mentioned before, and we can discuss it afterwards in the questions. So now the results of the best estimate uncertainty quantification can be seen. And uh, on the left side, we have the uh, histograms that were estimated for our four quantities of interest. And we can see that the, linear, the maximum linear power has a large variance, let's say, of 60% uh, uncertainty, relative standard deviation of variance of 60%, and it has a non-normal behavior. While the fuel stored enthalpy uh, has, a, a, has a normal distribution with around 20% of relative standard deviation. This is, uh, these differences can be, is probably related to the fact that we can see the fuel stored enthalpy as a kind of integral of the, the power, so it's, as, uh, uh, and thus it's more linear with respect to, to our inputs in the road dejection action, of course. Uh, now we have also the 2D linear power map that we, we uh, is our functional quantity and we show the radial distribution of the standard, re relative standard dev deviation. And we can see that uh, the highest uncertainties are attributed to the locations closer to the ejection, but uh, we don't see also very large variation. So it goes from 53 to 58% for example. Uh, now, uh, with regards to th those three inputs, we see that the only, imp from the estimated Shapley indices on the right, 
we see that the main important inputs are the neutronics one, uh, where around 50% of the variance is attributed to the delayed, effective delayed neutral fraction, and the other 50% is attributed to the neutronic cross-sections. We cannot, be, we cannot associate so easily the weights between the different cross-sections because they are fully correlated, but we know that 50% is due to the cross-sections and 50% due to the effective delay neutral fractions. In the last quantity, the distance to, uh, from the um, DNB, we see that we obtain a very large nonlinear, uh, uh, non-normal non uh, distribution with around 57% of variance, uh, and, but quite a low probability to reach it Still, we have uh, an uh, average value of uh, a six. And uh, the way we pose this criterion, in order to reach it, we need, we need it to go to negative values. So we are quite away, the probability is quite low, uh, but the most important quantity we can see that is the gap heat transfer. And this is due to the fact that we impose a constant value with large, mar large uncertainties. And we can see that this creates uh, around 50% uh, is responsible for around 50% of the variance of this quantity, while the rest 50% is split between the neutronics uh, quantities. So we would like to reduce this uh, importance of the gap heat transfer by improving our gap heat transfer model. And this motivates us to develop this approach that we are going to present uh, now in this part. So first, uh, we want to calibrate the gap heat transfer model. Uh, why? Because uh, in general, the physics involved in the gap heat, to estimate the gap heat transfer are very complex. And high fidelity codes can model uh, very uh, complex like uh, phenomena like the physical, chemi physical chemical phenomena such as the fission gas production and fission gas release or, um, or the high burn up structure, uh, etc. But we also have, um, we also have a, a, a lot of phenomena that span the gap, the fuel and the cladding from creep to oxida oxidation in the cladding to the pellet cladding mechanical interaction that occurs uh, during the depletion and can occur also during the, the road ejection transient. So those uh, parameters affect both our initial conditions and our transient behavior. So we need to have a model that can at least learn from a high fidelity code that can model at least some of those uh, phenomena and inform our very poor uh, models uh, age gap so far. So the approach that we take is to define a simplified model and we will compare it to a typical high fidelity modeling found in the codes where the gap heat transfer is usually split in three parts where you have one part that is attributed to the conduction through the gas, one uh, due to radiation, uh, and one that is uh, through the contact, when the contact uh, between the pellet and the cladding occurs. So this part, when there is no contact, it's zero. When there is contact, it adds a term of conduction to our uh, equation. Now, in the simplified approach, we say, okay, we will consider only the gas conduction. Uh, and we think that neglecting the radiation term is not significant since uh, it, it, it usually is, this parameter is not significant before the cladding burst. And since we will not model after the burst, uh, we can pretty much throw it away. Then uh, we know that probably we, can, we could obtain some pellet cladding mechanical interaction in our fuel rods. So, so after this happens, uh, for a simplicity, our approach will consider the gap to be closed. Uh, and finally, we know that there are uncertainties on, in, or on our initial states, so we will consider them in the initial state uh, uh, variables, in the initial age gap. So uh, now let's compare how the conduction term is modeled and how our term is modeled, is simplified. So the gas conductive, so the conduction model in the usually high fidelity modelings, is a ratio between the gas conductivity that is calculated based on the fusion gas releases in the gap and the different isotopes, et cetera, and they predict how this conductivity decreases. Uh, and also there is an effective gap due to some micro effects like the jump uh, distance in the, the temperature dis uh, that creates temp uh, temperature discontinuities closer to the surfaces of the pellet and the cladding. Uh, and also it accounts for the roughnesses. Uh, so in our approach, what we do is first to simplify the gas conductivity and we say, okay, uh, we know that it will not be constant at the initial values and it will evolve uh, due to both fission gas release and to the temperature uh, that changes. So we say, okay, we will consider it as a function in a similar way to the thermal expansion coefficients uh, based on the temperature and the stored energy in our transients. 
Uh, then we will of approximate that we will not model the jump distances because already our model is not so high, it's not so of, of high fidelity, it's not an approximation, so we don't need so, so detailed uh, behaviors to be included. Then uh, we will model our gap width based on the, only on the fuel thermal expansion, an approximation that we think is reasonable uh, because um, of the temperatures that will rise fast this will be the dominant factor in the closing of the gap. So we consider this as a valid assumption for the road ejection, at least from hot zero power. Then, as I mentioned, we know our initial gas conductivity. Since we have our initial gas, um, gas con uh, con uh, con <coughs> heat transfer and the gap width. This is a result of a previous analysis where they did the depletion calculation in the high fidelity code. And we can also have, as we're gonna see later, an estimate of the uncertainty uh, in this parameter. Uh, finally, uh, the gas conductivity is modeled by a function that depends on the temperature and the uh, stored energy, as we mentioned, and it has two, we insert two calibration parameters in order to uh, adapt to those two quantities, theta one and theta two. So those uh, two parameters are the ones that uh, we want to calibrate at the end. But we need a method to calibrate because it's not so easy. We have a 3D problem in time for the, uh, in the whole core. So we need to have some kind of methodology to, to simplify and to learn the models. So our first starting point or point zero for this methodology is our previous best estimate and certain quantification results that we saw. So once we do these calculations, we have a, let's say a rough estimate of what will be our power evolution in 3D in all the meshes actually radial. So we have a lot of information that we need to, to uh, extract information from it. Uh, we need to extract it. And we need to profit from it uh, without running any other calculation before running any other calculation. Also, in parallel, we, uh, we need to cluster our assemblies because it's not efficient to build one gap heat transfer model for each fuel road uh, um, because we have a lot of fuel assemblies. And so we need stuff to cluster in, uh, to have a meaningful clustering. And we wanna see, we, we will cluster them based on the burn up because due to the loading pattern, we, will, we observe that a lot of them uh, of the burn-ups are very similar in values. So we make the approximation that we, that we share the same calibration parameters. This, however, does not, see, uh, that does not mean that we share the same edge gap value since the model depends on the temperatures, on the local temperatures uh, and stored energy. But they will share the same calibration parameters. There's one, once we group our, uh, let's say, simplify our geometry in groups of models, and we have our previous, uh, let's say, available data set, we need to define out of all these data sets because there are uncertainty also. It's not only spatially and temporal, but it's also a, we have a lot of samples of it. So we need to define of all of those samples, what are some representative ones in order to calibrate efficiently our model. So what we did is that we said, okay, we need to treat both statistical and spatial aspects in order to treat the, uh, all the, at least all the possible, to have a range of variations that covers most of the variations that can be observed in the gap heat transfer. A, and the approach that we take is that we will take the mean, the mean scenario and we'll take also the lower quantile and the upper quantile of 2.5 and 97.5%. This quantile is estimated on the local linear, maximum linear power. So we will see which scenario lead to those quantiles and we will extract all the 3D information from the rep representative assemblies of each cluster. The, then the data, all this data will be extracted, will be fed to the high fidelity code, Alcyon, that will perform decoupled road ejection transients. And then we will have our high fidelity prediction for our gap heat transfer model. And we can fit both data in our calibration model and uh, calibrate it through minimizing a, a mean square, the mean square error on some particular set of data, uh, namely the maximum of the gap heat transfer during the transients in the specific uh, pulses that we extracted and the last value. Finally, once we calibrate our model, we, need, we will estimate its uncertainty in a preliminary way, but we will estimate it, both for the model and its initial conditions. Finally, the, next, the final step will be to include it in, in, an, in an improved best estimate uncertainty quantification. Let's focus on the first two parts of the, let's say, post-treatment of the transient. So, based on the large data set, uh, first we cluster our uh, assemblies, and you can see the clustering that we selected so uh, most of the assemblies due to the end of cycle uh, loading pattern that we have are between 15, 30 and 45 yawa days per ton. So we will use one edge gap model for uh, those three categories. 
and we also included the two uh, extremes, 10 and 53, uh, for a possibility in the future if we want to, for example, interpolate between the calibration parameters to have a, a more uh, finer disc discretization of our clustering, uh, let's say. So we have five groups, and now for each group, what we do is that okay, we say, okay, for the mean and for the upper quantile, when we want to have the largest variations, we'll take uh, the pulses from the assemblies that we see in a green circle, uh, highlighted with a green circle, that are closest to the control rod ejection, because it's this location that sees the maximum variation at the uh, so so we expect by taking the maximum in statistic in statistical aspects and in space we will have in general the maximum now for the lower quantile uh, we will take the opposite the mirroring assemblies where they see the less variations and so with the the lowest statistical uh, quantile and the lowest let's say variations in the in the in spatial spatially we expect to cover also the lowest uh, age gap variations. So we extract our data for each different model of the five ones, and now we want to calibrate it. So here we see the results of the calibrated. So we calibrate again based on the minimization of the mean square error between the Alcyon calculations, the heavy daily calculations, and our model predictions. And we do it at two instances for all the axial nodes. We do it at the instant of the maximum and at the instant and the last value of the gap heat transfer. And we can see the evolution of the calibration error for our uh, three, the three, three main um, uh, groups, uh, clusters. Uh, we present only those because the other two will just, uh, we, we use them to cover all the bounds, but they are not really important for the transient since they are far away from the, the control road ejection location. So we can see that the, what is interesting, why well, we can see both the estimation of the mean values for our parameters, and what is very interesting is that we see an increase in the error with burnout. So the higher we go in burn up, the higher is the error. And also these highlights are the limitation of our model because it's a very simplistic model and maybe with higher burn up, we will need something more sophisticated. And also that because there are more uncertainties involved in the higher burn up, initial burn up. Now we need to quantify the uncertainty of this calibrated model. And what we do is that we say, okay, we will find bounds in our parameters that lay that cover the calibration error that you saw before so in order to simplify the, the uh, to simplify the process in order to how we will find these bounds we make the assumption that the parameters are fully correlated this might not be uh, strictly the case but we observed through uh, uh, by doing this that we can efficiently create bounds into the two parameters by correlating them creating essentially one uh, one uh, parameter for the model uh, that covers, that creates bounds around our mean prediction. And we can see the result for the, for the maximum variation of age gap for the three different clusters. And uh, we can see that we managed to, to bound, let's say, the Alcyon predictions with our model. Although, as we saw for the calibration error, of course, we need larger bounds for our higher burnups. Uh, and and that's why, again, the limitation, that highlights also the limitation of our model, since it will increase the uncertainty in these locations. Also, uh, a last point was the initial conditions, as we mentioned, they are considered as uncertain and, with, and we assigned a normal distribution with a 10% uh, standard deviation. And this was a result of a previous depletion calculation only using the high fidelity code. I guess, so we can see that we add two more parameters, but not the age gap itself now. Let's go now, let's introduce this model to our previous best estimate coupling and see what this uh, brings to our model. So what is important to, uh, to highlight is that when we do this, when we improve our model with this uh, simplified calibrated model, first the, we obtain the same computational um, uh, cost with the, pre, with the best estimate coupling. And this is due to the fact because our model is very simple. It's just a, a function at the end that we fit. So it's, it's just the cost of estimating this function at its size time, time steps. So it's negligible compared to the other codes and thus does not increase our computational cost. Another point is that now, instead of having one parameter, uh, one, the edge gap as uncertain, we now have two parameters that are related to the initial conditions of the model, the one, and the other parameter to the, the calibration parameters. So we have one model parameter that we call HGM and our initial conditions, which we call HGI. 
parameters. So we have 23 inputs in the Arsenic quantification. And now we are ready to perform again the Arsenic quantification and see what does this, uh, how does this impact our, uh, our previous results. So the major impact, as probably you expect, is on the DNB, because we saw that the age, age gap was significant, was very important for this uh, parameter. Uh, so now what we observe is that the first, there is a big impact on the variance, on the relative standard deviation of the distance to reaching boiling crisis. And this is due to the fact that uh, age gap is not any more important, is not any one, anymore contributing to the variance. And we can see that our UQ methodology selects only the initial conditions and not, not only even the model calibration parameters as potentially important, but uh, does not assign any significant sensitivity to it. So we reduce the importance only to the neutronics inputs as for the other quantities. So this reduce, reduces from 57% of the variance to 42. And uh, we also see a shift in the mean towards higher value from six to around seven. And this shift uh, together with the variance, essentially what it does is that it decreases the probability of reaching, reaching DNB conditions, which is important since it, gain, it leads to, to margins in our uh, design uh, space. Uh, now, why the mean shifts is, uh, we can understand it by uh, trying to understand the different modelizations of our gap heat transfer. In the best estimate, we applied one constant value with large bounds. So in average, compared to our model, it, it, it has larger value, and both because it applies this uh, uniformly in time, while our model finds a, a better, uh, a more accurate uh, prediction in time, but also in terms of mean variation, it's much smaller because it's more realistic ours and our bounds are much smaller. And this, uh, let's say average less, uh, more uh, larger uh, heat uh, extracted in the best estimate coupling means that more heat, um, uh, the, the largest heat, more heat reaches the DNB, the, the, the coolant. And that since more, more heat in average reaches the coolant, we are, closer to our DNB conditions. And that's why the mean shifts to safer conditions. In our case, since we have less extracted heat. Now, let's move to the, let's see the impact on the other quantities. Of course, as we expect, there's no impact on the variance since edge gap is not important for those inputs uh, in terms of variance. However, we see an impact in the mean. And this again is uh, attributed to the fact that we extract more heat. So because we extract more heat, uh, in the, at least if we, if we look at the improved best estimate, we extract less heat. So because we extract less heat, the, we have more heat in the fuel, more te higher temperatures in the fuel, and thus higher Doppler feedback, creating a, uh, the, the peak to arrive earlier and uh, to arrive at a smaller uh, value uh, due to the higher Doppler feedback. At least th that's our understanding of, of why this mean shift uh, occurs. Uh, now, if we go to the 2D quantity, we see a similar behavior as the scalar one. We don't see any significant impact on the variance and a small shift uh, in the mean values. Looking now in the fuel stored enthalpy, uh, we see a small impact in the variance compared to the linear power. And this uh, might be attributed to the fact that maybe the, we under predict the sensitivity of this gap in this parameter. Maybe finally it has some small contribution. And, um, and also we observe uh, again for the same reason as we saw for the local linear power, a shift in the mean of the fuel stored enthalpy. And this again, because we have extract more heat, uh, less heat in the improved best estimate, we have more heat in our fuel and thus increased fuel uh, stored enthalpy and thus higher mean value. Finally, uh, we thought thing that is interesting to uh, observe the edge gap uh, from the perspective of an output of interest and not of, of, as an input since now it's not an input anymore. And we can uh, estimate the mean and the standard deviation for the whole 3D uh, uh, prediction of our gap heat transfer in time. And uh, we do this and we provide uh, the, the mean and the values we will see later uh, for two axial um, uh, cross sections, the one at the both are at the location of the maximum in space and time. So we cut axially and radially, and we can see the mean uh, that is observed. And we can see also that uh, the highest contribution of the initial conditions, which is very interesting uh, and also expected. Uh, and this we can understand it mainly from the variance because those indices are based on the variance importance 
So what we see is that the variance has a lower threshold of 10%. This 10% is because all our initial conditions vary 10%, regardless of where it is the model. However, only in the locations where they see a power, uh, high power, they will see a larger uncertainty due to the neutronics parameters. And the, the uncertainty will increase to 30%. That's why when we estimate the sensitivities, because they are based on the whole 3D quantity, 4D in time, uh, uh, essentially they attribute more weight to the initial conditions. And it's interesting that we don't even see the modeling parameters, meaning that more or less what we need is not to accurately calculate our parameters, but at least to define correctly the evolution, uh, an average evolution. We don't need to have the accurate uncertainties of the model, or at least for this application. And, uh, and it will, we think it will be very interesting, but we didn't do, do it, to do a sensitivity analysis only on where we see a significant pow uh, power increase. And probably there, what we, the sensitivities will look like is that the neutronics importance will increase a lot. Uh, finally, once we have um, our approved best estimates, uh, we said, okay, why not do some more studies since we have something of higher fidelity uh, in terms of coupling with regards to the previous one. And what we did is that we wanted to extend to more steady quantities, for example, the linear power, the Fiostral enthalpy, the cladding wall, wall heat flux, and the coolant density. Also, we wanted to see the impact of transverse flow because we, we were using a multi 1D thermal hydraulics. So we wanted to do what will the 3D bring in the table. Uh, and finally, we want to quantify the impact of using a finer thermal hydraulic uh, meshing uh, or similar to the neutronics with one channel per quarter of assembly. So what the results were obtained for these additional studies, and we're gonna see in the next slide the 3D results, uh, is that uh, the transverse flow, the 3D thermohydraulics, lead to a 7% decrease in the DNB mean, meaning that we are closer to reaching the DNB. And this is, uh, so we have a higher probability of reaching it. And this is because the transverse, transverse flow reduced the axial flow. And thus, uh, uh, the same heat is extracted from less coolant and uh, and thus is more, uh, is closer to the DNB. Now, the impact of the finer thermodynamic discretization is that first it leads to a shift in the local linear, maximum linear power closer to the refle reflector. It even changes an assembly because it goes to the next quarter of assembly uh, that is in the next assembly, located in the next assembly closer to the reflector. This is due to the large gradient in our linear power. So because our gradient is large, uh, the finer discretization in the thermohydraulics leads to also a higher local linear power inserted in the thermohydraulics model uh, due to the not having this averaging process. Uh, finally, the impact of the finer thermohydraulics is that it leads to a further decrease of the DNB mean of 4%. And this is again due to the fact that now we have a higher local linear maximum linear power seen by our, our channel and thus more heat will be extracted and thus decrease, uh, bring, bring us closer to the DNP conditions. Now, uh, the 3D results. So first we can see the mean and uh, the variance. We want to present the, the radial ones uh, uh, to simplify. And the, the impact in the linear, 3D linear power, 2D in this case, uh, of the whole 3D is that uh, we can see that it moves the maximum location towards the uh, peripheral uh, assembly uh, compared to the previous one. And we can also see why, because there, if you take the average between the four um, measures in each assembly, you will see that the average in the uh, assembly uh, be, uh, further from the reflector is higher. Uh, we also see the same pattern in our uh, uncertainty, meaning that there's no impact in the uncertainty from the modeling. And this is uh, also uh, expected because we expect the model to have a bias more or less, not so much an impact on the uncertainty. Uh, now the first order enthalpy, again, the radial 2D quantity, uh, we see a similar trend, of course, with uh, following the linear power. But what is interesting is that we see an inverse trend in the uncertainty. That uh, we do not know exactly why this happened. And uh, we saw also larger variations, but uh, our uh, intuition, our only guess for the moment is that uh, this might be attributed to the fact that we, this is the relative standard deviation. So we divide by a mean value. So maybe this mean division can create this uh, behavior. Uh, we don't exactly understand this part, although. Now, if we move to the other quantities, the cladding wall heat flux has an interesting behavior in uh, the, its uncertainty. In the mean value, well, we more or less see what we expect. 
uh, in this case, the maximum value is, of course, in the, is not in the, uh, where the maximum linear power is because the cladding wall heat flux depends also on the burn up and thus on the edge gap that we have. So the maximum uh, cladding wall heat flux is located in the highest burn up assembly that is closest to the controller of the ejection. Uh, and, but in the, and this is reflected also in the variance where we can see a checkboard uh, kind of uh, map of uncertainties due to the fact that the burn up has this kind of distribution and thus the initial edge gap conditions as well. Uh, but of course, higher, the higher uncertainties are observed when higher power is uh, located to the location with higher power. Finally, our 3D edge gap is re-estimated. Uh, and, uh, and again, we see what we expect that now in our edge gap uh, model, the, the highest contribution is the quarter of assembly that is both closer to the controller of ejection, but also closer to, uh, to, to the reflector. So the upper right one. Finally, some general conclusions about this work and some perspectives. So one conclusion is, the first conclusion is that we can see that in road ejection aesthetic quantification, there is a significant benefit that can be obtained from high to low uh, edge gap approaches. Uh, here we presented a preliminary high to low approach, uh, where a simplified model based on geothermal expansion was calibrated on limited high fidelity calculations. And it's used in this improve, to create this improved best estimate framework. We also uh, estimated the uncertainty of the model and propagated it into the, uh, through an uncertainty quantification. And it was found that the, the uncertainty of the model was negligible. Uh, so its impact on the calculations is not any more important. Uh, this led to uh, an, a large impact on the DNB, decreasing the probability of reaching a uh, boiling crisis compared to, let's say, the more conservative approach that we had before. And now our uh, additional studies that were performed we're using this improved best estimate coupling show that there is probably a, a high interest to using 3D thermal hydraulics models with channels, with finer uh, channel discretization to the level at least of the quarter of assembly, especially if we want to do a safety related calculation because this decreases the, uh, increases the probability of reaching uh, the DNB conditions. Finally, some perspectives. Uh, we try to organize our perspectives uh, with regards to where our work is situated in the big landscape. So we identify two axes of possible perspectives, one concerning the transient modeling and one concerning the uncertainty quantification modeling. Uh, because the thesis also was, uh, had uh, both parts uh, inside it. So, in terms of uncertainty modeling, what we can do is go to a spatial, to include spatial, uh, spatial functional inputs. For the moment, we include only uniform, uh, we apply uniformly the uncertainty in the whole space, but which is not uh, uh, accurate. So we, we would like to have a functional uh, distribution uh, of how we apply the uncertainty in space. We'd like also to treat discontinuities. Uh, it will be very challenging for the uncertainty quantification model, especially if we reach some DNB conditions, for example, where there is a, a change of models, and this can create larger, large discontinuities in the, in the results. And of course, investigate other sources of uncertainty, such as other models uncertainty. In the transient modeling perspective, we, can, we would like to, we could go to a pin by pin level of homogenization, at least in a minimum core case, but uh, for the moment, uh, we could also improve the edge gap model because we saw that is, is a, a simplified one, and it could also in, be included in some representative benchmarks of uncertainties in the nuclear in, um, community like the UIM benchmark. And, uh, and also we could study other type of transients. Now, in order to uh, also put this in the perspective of our work, we have this figure that uh, is, is uh, discretized based on uh, how we model tra tra the transient and the uncertainties. So the one one point is where we, we take uniform uh, modeling for both of them. In transient, this uniform will be point kinetics, for example, with average feedbacks, et cetera. And in uncertainties, will be, as we do now, uh, uh, uniform, uh, uniform application of the uncertainties on the whole core. Uh, what we were, the location that we were in was the, uh, where we had spatial discretization of our transient, but coarse one uh, in the level of assembly. And uh, again, we kept the same uniform uncertainties uh, modeling. Uh, we think that the next step will be to apply, as we mentioned, a spatial uncertainty quantification modeling to be at the same level, at least, of the core modeling. And then we can stepwise increase our modeling to a pin by pin, as we mentioned, uh, and then also increase uh, our uncertainty quantification uh, modeling by going to a finer, 
fine error mo modeling. So uh, a paper is in the reviewing process with mainly what you saw. Uh, for more information, uh, I refer you back to my thesis uh, manuscript. Uh, and thank you for your attention. And please ask me any question you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gregory. Uh, I am Kostadin Ivanov, professor in Department Hat. Uh, I, I will be um, uh, basically uh, completing the last part of the seminar and coordinating the question and answer. Please, questions, comments. Let me see, there is something on the chat. If, if you have questions, you can unmute and ask the question, or you can send a question on the chat. I, I will read it. So Gregory, maybe I can ask a question. Um, so yes. this, uh, as you propagate this uncertainty, this will be on the fuel uh, modeling side, right? Uh, uh, and, you mean the, the calibration, the initial condition? Right. right. Yes. yes. And then in the, when you combine with multi-physics, they will be combined with thermohydraulic and reactor physics uncertainty to propagate to multi-physics uh, responses, right? Yes, they, they should be, but uh, we should also take care of uh, having a consistent uncertainty framework because uh, a lot of those uncertainties will be, uh, we have common sources mm -hmm. uh, and thus, uh, for example, uh, the gap width will impact both neutronics, fuel thermal and thermal hydraulics. And so we will need to, um, to, be sure, uh, to, to be sure that we propagate them consistently and thus we will need to estimate some kind of global multiphysics covariance various matrix and uh, this part was uh, uh, part of the research of Kai, Dr. Kaiyu Zheng, uh, which did a lot of work uh, in his thesis for this aspect. And uh, it's in our plans to continue his work. So uh, I, I completely agree because uh, uh, having the uncertainty from given physics phenomena uh, from uh, it, it uh, like having uh, the same uncertainties, let's say manufacturing, uh, propagated in different physics and then combine multi-physics can lead to misleading answers, right? They, they have to be somehow correlated. Yeah, I think that's the yes. approach. Yes, and also it can be to misleading and also false penalized conditions maybe. We don't, we don't know if, uh, what will be the worst case in that, necessarily at least. So we need to be careful. Yes, so we, we previously have done work on propagating the uncertainty in uh, fuel conductivity, now gas gap conductance. Uh, are there other parameters in the fuel modeling where we have to take into account the uncertainties? How do you think? I think that uh, there, this is, a, I think, a, a kind of a trade-off between what the code can model, uh, because all these uncertainties are based on the, our lower fidelity code, uh, if we use. So there is a trade-off, I think, between uh, uh, at one point the modeling. Uh, then I think we should in include maybe a few more. Uh, uh, we should try to include maybe a few more, like the, uh, maybe a high, a better edge gap modeling, including some fission gas release uncertainty. But this will be related to the application. We have to to uh, see for each application if road ejection or a depletion or another or local transient. We need to see which are the input parameters that are necessary for, this, for each, uh, for each uh, scenario. And, um, and once we do this, we have to be, I think there is a trade-off between improving the model and improving the, uh, the uncertainties in the parameters. Because there's no, I mean, it doesn't make sense to increase a lot the, uh, let's say the uncertainty modeling, to have a better uncertainty modeling in a poor model that is input in a poor model, let's say. So, uh, that's what I think. Uh, we should try to, as in the graph I showed, we should try to progress together, both together. So, so, so what we need from higher fidelity 
caught when we do imp when you inform low fidelity we want the values mean values plus uncertainties right that's yes we, we need the uh, yes and of course then we, we can ask ourselves if uh, if the normal distribution is the best way to propagate uncertainty of other, we, we can ask a lot of questions afterwards. But uh, yeah, we, we need to provide ideally step by step from each physics, uh, in each step uncertainties that are propagated consistently throughout each physics, uh, and then in the multi-physics calculation as well. Uh, it's something very challenging, but I think uh, we, we could do some progress in the future in this aspect. Yes, so I got um, a question from Mustafa Hamza. Mm -hmm. Where did you get the post DMB gut heat transfer coefficient to fit in your model? And what are the assumptions made here? Uh, the post DMB, uh, it's based on the code itself. I mean, we uh, on Flicka, we, uh, so it has some, let's say, built in. Uh, we discussed it with some CI experts and the developers, and we saw what was the uncertainty of this parameter. And, uh, but uh, we, we didn't pay too much time on it because we never reached the post DNB conditions. So we put the parameter inside in case we reach it and we use it to increase our input dimensions to, to show that we can identify that this parameter, for example, is, not, is correctly rejected in the uncertainty quantification method. Uh, so I, I agree that uh, we should pay more attention, especially if we have some calculations that reach this DNB. Uh, but you can see that from the probabilities that we had, like with a mean around six and uh, the 57% of variance, we never, at least, it's highly improbable to reach conditions uh, below our zero criteria for risk in DNB. So, but I think it's a future perspective as well. Okay, uh, other questions or comments? Uh, I don't see anything on the chat. Uh, maybe if you want to ask, maybe you can unmute and ask. Uh, what about uh, people present at the, at the seminar? Are there some questions there? Uh, there, are, there are no, uh, it's only Mario here. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so we should expect uh, questions from Mario, right? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, last call for questions or comments. Yes, I don't see anything. So let's thank our speaker, uh, Dr. Gregory Delipe. Thanks, Gregory. It was very interesting and s certainly very uh, actual and state-of-the-art uh, research. Uh, thank you. And uh, I am closing the seminar. Thank you thank very you much. Very, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>